do you feel when you see this logo? You must see this logo every day when you're walking down the street, you see it online, knowing what you went through for this brand to be what it is. What, what's your first feelings when you see this logo? If you're working together, you achieve. If you're pulling apart, there is no achievement. There, you, you go nowhere. Do you feel like there's still innovation to be done in the shoe game? Or do you feel that it's plateaued? Do you have any like rules or lessons that you learned to be like, how can I maintain a healthy family while growing a massive business? Because there has to be sacrifice. You can't be in both places at once. No. But like, would you have done anything differently? An hour later, he came back and said, Joe, Aztec, five stars. Fantastic. Said, Not only that, Midas and Inca, he's the out of the two shoes, they've also got five stars. So that's how we got into America. Three five star shoes. But it had taken me 11 years. You weren't even on Adidas's radar until you started to grow a little bit and then they contacted you about a logo infringement. Mm. <laughs> yes. And then mm. they, they, they ended up buying you for close to $4 billion. And it's like, um, what, what, what do those like numbers mean to you? The numbers just become numbers with zeros. Mm -hmm. You just lose the number of zeros. I mean, I, I remember many, many years ago signing my first million, do million pound check. Did loneliness ever creep in? Welcome back guys, um, it's an honour and a privilege to sit down next to Joe Foster, shoemaker, founder of Reebok and um, honestly just to, to, to sit down with you is such an honour Joe so thank you so much for agreeing to do the interview and uh, I, I read the book and uh, I was just fascinated by the story and it's almost like, a, like an untold story that a lot of people don't really know the true origins of Reebok and the uh, the grit and the perseverance of what you had to go through to build the brand to what many people see today. So a after listening to the audiobook and reading the book, um, I was like, I have to connect with you. And I wrote you a message on Instagram. You replied, we set up the interview. So thank you so much uh, for, for just sitting down and sharing your wisdom and sharing your knowledge uh, with the audience today. I'm super grateful. It's a real pleasure. It really is <clears throat> delightful. I mean, we've had a lunch and we've had a very nice conversation. So this is going to be very interesting. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and I wanted, uh, out of respect, to wear the hoodie. It's proud for me to wear it. So I was wondering to start off, how do you feel when you see this logo? You must see this logo every day when you're walking down the street. You see it online today, knowing what you went through for this brand to be what it is. What, what was your first feelings when you see this logo? Well, <clears throat> surprisingly enough, I, I really, uh, I really, I'm able to see it even through walls. It's, it's one of those things that, <clears throat> having, well, founded the brand and sort of grown up with the logo, the whole thing. Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess I don't know if it's proud these days or just another, another. You're just pleased to see that it's out there. There's more. The brand is out there still, mm -hmm. still out there after all this time, <clears throat> and. Uh, I guess it's, it's probably one of the problems of having been a founder of a brand which is visible. Mm -hmm. um, that wherever we go, um, one of the problems is looking at shoes. Mm -hmm. And they're always looking. At, and Julie will tell you that, uh, you know, we're, oh, another pair of Reebok there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Look at that. So, yeah, it is. Uh, I, I guess I guess it, it it could be explained as proud, but I, I think after all these years, it, it's more a, a matter of being thrilled mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the fact that that brand is still there mm -hmm. and people are, are buying it. And it's uh, it's got to the point now where it's uh, it's sort of a, a brand that just goes on. Yeah, just timeless now. And speaking of the brand and its origins, Reebok actually started before you in that it was uh, your grandfather which started off as a shoemaker, the, the, the name then was a, co a cobbler, we say, right, as a, as a shoemaker, and it was uh, Joe Foster, and you were named after your grandfather, right? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, my grandfather, he was born in uh, 1880. Yeah. Um, there's a bit of a dis dispute, but you know, back in those days, it was 18, 1880 or 1881, uh, but we do have his, uh, a copy of the birth certificate, and on that it's 1880, so <clears throat> we, we sort of accept now it's 1880. And it's when he was 15 that he made a pair of running shoes for himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he started life as a cobbler. His, uh, his parents, they had a confectioner's shop. Mm -hmm. His grandfather was a cobbler. Mm -hmm. But his grandfather was down, I think it was in Nottingham. <clears throat> so he didn't see much of him, but he didn't want to be a confectioner, he wanted to be a cobbler. So, so he started life as a cobbler, 15 years old. So basically it's in your DNA of your fan family that your grandfather was a cobbler and 
your grandfather's grandfather was also a cobbler. So like essentially shoemaking is in your in your in your blood basically. So in in the book there's so many stories and we were chatting at lunch as well that even if I was just to ask you the story the origin story about your grandfather we could talk about that for a half an hour as well so like I've, I've written <laughs> yes. so many questions and normally when I do an interview I never have notes I always just do my preparation and we just let the conversation flow but there's so many key points in the story that I'm just like I want to I've got questions I want to ask and some bits I want to okay. quote from the book as well which is why I've got my iPad here in front of me because there's some things I don't want to forget so we'll get um, We'll go more deeper into the story, but one of my favorite things early on in the book was uh, how you came up with the name Reebok. I think that's such a cool story because it started when you were nine years old when you won a race. And then because <laughs> of that is the reason that the brand is what it's called. So would you mind sharing that story about how Reebok came about, how you chose that name? Well, we, we, we've got to now consider that um, we started our business, Jeff and myself. We left the parent company and set up our business as Mercury Sports Footwear. <clears throat> Mercury Sports were very happy with that name, great, no problem with that, and we were doing nicely. Our accountant said, Joe, you're making some money, that's fine, register your name. What? Register, why? You know, it's like, this minute, nobody mentioned it, like registering names. Um, the parent uh, company, J.W. Foster, that's your name, J.W. Foster. <clears throat> but of course we realised, okay, Mercury is not our name. How do we register the name? Well, he told me go and see a patent agent, and he gave me the name of a patent agent in Manchester. I went to see him, and uh, we found out that Mercury was already pre-registered by Lotus and Delta, a British shoe corporation company. Oh, um, he said, but uh, they have offered it to you for a thousand pound if you want it. Ah. Thousand pound. We just set up a factory for two hundred and fifty pounds. A whole factory. <clears throat> you could buy a machine for ten pounds. A thousand pounds? We didn't have a thousand pounds. And the bank, we're only eighteen months into a business. We're making a bit of money, but a thousand pounds was oh, way out way out of sight. Uh, he said, Well, okay, if you uh, don't want to buy it, you can take them to court and uh, you can claim because they're not using it, they've just got it registered. I said, Well, how much will that cost? And he said about a thousand pounds. Well, Okay, so you can't afford a thousand pounds either way, you've got to find a new name. Which was like a new name. We were 18 months, we're excited, we're into our business, we're, we're going nicely. You've got to find a new name. So I go back, we sit around the table, and you know, we're thinking of names like Cougar. It's a good name, Cougar Sports. Why not? Cougar Sports. Uh, Falcon. <clears throat> so we were on that sort of animal, bird, sort of sport, something aggressive. Yeah, that's okay. Now, let me take you back to 1943, and I was actually eight years old at that time. 1943, and uh, middle of World War II. Just like COVID, nobody can go anywhere. It, you know, it's stay at home. In fact, we had stay at home holidays in, in those days. Uh, and Okay, so we had an event, a running event, and I was entered into it. I'm eight years old, a 60 yard race, I think it was, and uh, I won. I won the race. I'm in Foster Spikes, of course. I was about to say that. You uh, won the race because your grandfather invented this spike running shoe. Yes. You were wearing spikes, and as a result, you won the race. You won the race, and your prize for winning the race was a US dictionary. Well, I mean, that was it. I went up to collect my prize. And what did they give me? They gave me a dictionary. Yeah, and I'm saying, come on, guys, where's the football? You know what I mean? I'm a kid. Where's the football? Oh. A dictionary, rather disgusting, but it was an American dictionary, yes. Uh, it was a Webster's dictionary, which is a generic name for a dictionary in America. It's not just one person makes everybody, and so Webster's dictionary, which, of course, for many years probably sat somewhere in my bedroom for whatever. But here I am now, we're, we're fast forward to 1960, we're looking for a new name. And my dictionary is sat there. And you know, I like letter R. I can't explain why, but it's one it's of those strong, things, you know, it's yeah. a strong letter. I open my dictionary at R and start thumbing through, and it's not long before you come to E, R, E, but it's R, W, E, B, O, K, what's that? Uh, it's a South African gazelle. Gazelle? Wow. Gazelle, we're a running company. Gazelle, that's got to be it. That went to the top of the list and went back to the uh, patent agent and said, look, You've got your 10 names, but we want that one. We have to be in love with this. It's got to be our passion. We've got to love this name. I so I gave him the name, and he, he, he's a lawyer. 
And he said, okay, Joe, see what we can do. Over a week later, because they've got to test this with, uh, with the register, he came back and said, look, Joe, you've got your wish. The one that's really clear of most obstacles, Reebok. A couple of things, don't worry about those, we can handle those. He said, but the, uh, the register has one caveat, and that is, if anybody makes shoes out of Reebok skin, you can't stop them. Well, you know, I looked, we looked at Jeff and I said, that'll never happen. Nobody's going to make shoes out of Reebok skin. No. So, Reebok, that's it. However, he said, because of that, you've got to go in part B of the register. Part A, part B, what's the difference? It's a register. Right. Ten years later, the registrar came back and said, we've moved you to part A of the register. And we asked the question, why? Well, now everybody knows that Reebok is a sports shoe. And the animal, unfortunately, comes second. And what I found fascinating about that is that had you been awarded uh, an English dictionary rather than an American dictionary, Reebok is actually spelt with an H. It's R-H, so, so yes. It, had you won a UK dictionary that day, perhaps, we all would have seen Reebok with, uh, with an H. So. That was one of my favorite uh, stories in the book. And another thing as well, which you, you kind of mentioned, is that in World War II, it's something you had to go through, and uh, it's when your, um, when your father had the, had the business. And I think today, like nowadays, like life, we, our generation's not had to go through like a world war. Life is so comfortable, everything's so easy, everything's so convenient. A lot of people thought going through COVID was difficult, which it was for some people, but, um, going through a world war and running a business is, is pretty difficult as well. So do you think that that shaped your drive and your work ethic and your persistence uh, because you had so many obstacles to jump through or was it a part of life because growing up and you, you were quite young at the time and you didn't necessarily know any better? <laughs> well, I think <clears throat> maybe my father and mother worried an awful lot about the war. Um, for Jeff and myself, Jeff was two years older than me. I don't even think Jeff thought of the war. We just thought it's these exciting times between being four years old and 10 years old. We were out there with friends, playing football, not kicking the dictionary about, but back to playing football, <clears throat> doing all the things you do as a kid. Mm. And there's no lights on, there's no lights from windows because you have blinds. And this is what life was like. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that was uh, a great problem for me. As I say, maybe my parents. Uh, my father was part of the Home Guard, which we all know about. Uh, mm -hmm. Had to spend some nights on Home Guard duty. Uh, but again, that just seemed like normal. Mm -hmm. you know, this is normal life. Um, but Jeff and myself, we were part of the scouting organization. At that time, young enough to be in the Cubs. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I guess you get a lot of discipline. It's funny how we got discipline from being in the scouting organization, mm -hmm. even after the war. You know, it's that sort of discipline. And I think that had a big effect on how you, how you think of what you want to do and how you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. But the war itself, no, I, I just think it was one of those experiences you go through as a youngster. Mm -hmm. And so you started off with the running shoe. We kind of talked a little bit on the way over here in terms of how your grandfather, grandfather had to transition from running shoe to, to military shoes uh, as a result of the war. But when you started the business ascension, when it was, uh, your brother and yourself, it was running shoes. Um, what are your thoughts on like the modern day running shoe compared to the running shoes that you developed back then? And do you feel like there's many technological advancements? I mean, you were just telling me about a shoe uh, on the way over here, which sounded very technical to me, but do you feel like there's still innovation to be done in the shoe game or do you feel that it's plateaued? <clears throat> well, I think there's always innovation in whatever you go into. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in, in apparel, you know, I mean, they, they keep on saying we're all going to be wired up and, we'll, you know, and you're just going to press a button and you speak to whoever. Well, we're almost there now. You know, you can do it with watches. Uh, we've all got smartphones now. With, uh, with footwear, I think it's low tech, mm -hmm. but it's still tech. Mm -hmm. Because uh, he, even when uh, we can go back to the Aztec, which was our shoe that got five stars, we just started using EVA mm -hmm. as a sponge, as a rubber because rubber itself is quite heavy, mm -hmm. but EVA is a plastic material, so that was, technology had moved us forward. That. Now they're moving forward, they've got different, different rubbers now, and they're, they're looking at and inventing different rubbers, lighter weight, more, more cushioning. The design of the sole can be one that promotes movement forward. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, they have things inside the shoe, carbon fibre, uh, springs almost, that can help again with this. So, yes, there'll always be somebody looking for technology, and it will be there in whatever way. There'll be new materials. So, so it, yes, footwear, low-tech, but yes, there's technology. And I, I'm curious, like, as a product developer, someone who's involved in supply chain, out of all the countless products that you've developed and you've brought to market, some were very successful, some failed, do you ever do you have a favorite product that you developed that you look back on that product and be like, that was always my favorite? And I know your brother Jeff was in charge of the production side of things. He was running the factory in Bury. And if I'm not mistaken, you were more in a sales role and you were getting distributors on board. You were looking at new markets. You targeted USA and uh, Paul, uh, which is, is quite, um, it has got an interesting part in, in the book as well, which helped with that US, USA expansion. He told you, get me a five-star running shoe and I'll break you into the USA market. And if I'm not mistaken, you got them three five-star running shoes. And, and five-star for anyone in the audience who's not sure, that's the, the ranking or the review that Runner's World magazine were giving the running shoes. And you gave him three five-star shoes and then he got on with the USA market. But was there, was there a product that you developed and when it came out, you're like, that is, that's the one, that's my favorite. And looking back now, is there a product that sticks out in your mind that's been, been your favorite? <clears throat> well, I mean, apart from Aztec, which was our five-star training shoe, because that's the volume. Mm -hmm. and, and really, I love that because it is the volume, because that's the, that's the product that takes you from where you are and gets you more visible, mm -hmm. brings you onto the market. Um, but probably the, the, the shoe that I think we we developed best was World 10. World 10 was um, <clears throat> a road shoe built on a track last. Now a track last is very narrow and the heel is only about that wide, whereas a normal running shoe it can be any width because normally when you're training or running, you strike with the heel mm -hmm. and then you roll down the outside of the foot and you toe off uh, on, your, on your big toe rear. That's where you go straight and you toe off. Whereas uh, this one, the World Ten was made for Ron Hill, and there are quite a few runners like this. They, I think, you ex explain them as floaters. Mm -hmm. What they do is they don't land on the heel at all. They always only land on the ball of the foot. So when they're running they're on the ball of the foot and, and toe off, never hit the heel. And uh, they're they're the best runners because they they use so little energy hitting the, with the heel. Uh, so we, we made that shoe for Ron Hill and he of course, he, he won the Boston Marathon in record time. He won a lot of marathons. He was our number one marathon runner in his time. And some of his records still stand today as well, if I'm not mistaken. And um, there's some great stories around the innovation of that. And there's so many great stories in the book, which I have to say, like for anyone listening, definitely make sure you pick up a copy of the book to hear all these like fantastic stories because as I said I've got so many questions here and I have to be very, very selective of which ones I ask because there's so many cool stories uh, in the book and w one of the other things I want to ask you is that um, w when was the switch from making the shoes because your factory was in Bury right just north of Manchester you grew up in Bolton yes but the factory is in Bury and uh, it's also because uh, your brother and yourself moved away from your family business in that you moved away, separated from your dad's business, you want to start your own thing, you started Mercury, that, that turned into Reebok, but you didn't want to do the production in your hometown because that's also where your father was running. Uh, True, yeah. <laughs> Foster and Sons, right? So you went to Bury, but then, you know, the, the US market, all these trade shows, these five-star running shoes came up. When was the switch from, right, we're making shoes in Bury to, right, now we're mass producing for the world? And what, 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 what happened in that time? Well, <clears throat> let me just take you back a little bit to the five-star shoes. Uh, we're talking about during the 1970s, um, Bob Anderson brought out his magazine, Runner's World. And at first, by 1975, from a single page, he would got to a 50-page color magazine, everybody read it. 350 million Americans, 35 million are probably out there running. So that's, that's his audience. That's, and he thought he could tell them all which shoe to buy. Mm -hmm. And he put these shoes through some sort of experiments to test them. But of course, he came up with Nike. Nike, number one shoe, that's the one to buy. Well, that's great. But Phil Knight could never satisfy that demand because probably three and a half million of all those runners wanted that shoe. He was in Japan trying to get the shoes, he couldn't. This happened twice. Phil Knight changed after 12 months and put another shoe as number one. 
and nobody could supply the shoe. It's then when he changed to five stars, he, it was obvious that one single shoe could never do the job. Five stars allowed three, four, maybe five shoes to be that top running shoe. That's when I knew we could, we could make a five star shoe. So <clears throat> it was making that five star shoe that then I'm at, uh, we tested it out in the Commonwealth Games in 1978 along with the other two shoes that got five stars and we got a shed load of medals. We got a lot of medals, great. <clears throat> so in 1979, I'm in 1979 at the NSGA show in Chicago and uh, Kmart. Kmart were a big retailing operation in America and uh, they came over and said we want 25,000 pairs. Oh, but I knew if we got a five star shoe, our small factory in Bury wouldn't cope. And 25,000 pairs of shoes, that was about six months work. Right, we had to get some help. So a friend of mine who's just set up uh, the uh, sporting shoe side of the barter business, and the barter were, in fact, they were the biggest shoe company in the world. So they said they would help. Fantastic, that's good. And they could do it at a better price than we could do it at. However, Kmart came and said, well, we also need a better price. But by that, they meant a better price. And that meant going to South Korea. We had to go to Asia. They could do the same product at less than half the price, and it, a good product. Fortunately, I had, uh, well, I'd got to know some people who were running the factory there, who, who were the agents for the factory in South Korea. So I'm thinking, okay, that's okay. So we, we can cover the price and we can cover the volume. Barter the volume, but then we may have to get to uh, South Korea if we want the price. Okay. Later in that show, the NSGA show in, in Chicago, Paul Feynman came along. And Paul Feynman, he was running Boston Camping. Boston Camping was a, a fairly small wholesale company doing camping equipment, uh, tents, fishing lines, you name it, all the outdoor stuff. Um, and Paul said, I could tell he was fed up. He, he, he'd been running this business for 10 years with his brother and his brother-in-law, and it was doing the same. They weren't going around the same fishbowl, neither growing, just sort of existing, as it were. And uh, I got on well with Paul. You know, we could talk together. And he said, Joe, if you get a five-star shoe, I'm your man. I'll be your distributor. Great. This is February. The shoe edition doesn't come out until August. We have a few months in between. I go back and uh, then I, I travel to America in May, go see Kmart and go and see the guy who wants to place 25,000 pairs and the reception said, he's in that room over there. I think it's row four, uh, number 10. Uh, and I am enter the room and I see all these buyers and I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is, not, this is not the environment I want for, for Reebok. And, you know, they, they will be judging the result of the money they make on that square footage that they give me. In the if, retail store. In the retail store. If we don't cover that, 25,000 pairs will be our first order and our last order. So uh, I'm a bit sort of confused, disappointed. However, I get back on the plane, go and see Paul in Boston. He picked me up from the airport, went to his place, meet his brother, um, meet his brother-in-law, nice operation. Jim Barkley, that was his salesman. Yeah, nice. This would be nice to bolt this, uh, our product on here. Fantastic. Okay. I'm back in England. And it's at the end of July. The last week in July, the August edition comes out for Runner's World. So I phoned Paul. I said, Paul, can you go down to the, you know, the kiosk? See if the Runner's World is out. The August Runner's World is out. An hour later, he came back and said, Joe, Aztec, five stars. Fantastic. Said, not only that, Midas and Inca, here's the other two shoes, they've also got five stars. So that's how we got into America. Three five star shoes. But it had taken me 11 years. And those 11 years had been trying to push into the market and that had been hard. Now, with five stars, the market wanted us. And that's the difference. And that's like a, a key theme of like persistence, which is in the book as well, that, you know, 
it's not as easy as like, okay, I develop a shoe, I get an order from Kmart, and then we start a business. As you mentioned there, there was 11 years of trial and error going, mm. going to different trade shows, trying to get the product uh, into the hands of different people, and eventually you found a way and, uh, and, and it cracked through. So like, I think a lot of people who are like running businesses today would never go at something for 11 years before they're like, right, now it's worked. So like, wh what was your mindset there in terms of like, it's Reebok or nothing like this. Because were you ever tempted to go down another career path when you were getting rejections and people weren't taking the orders? and Or were you always like, this is what I want to do with Reebok. I need to get it into the US. It will be the best running shoe. And that's really going to propel the business which I've envisioned in my mind. <clears throat> well, I, I think Reebok was that, uh, sorry, America was that step that I was looking for. Because the UK, nice market, but we were not in soccer or football. Mm -hmm. we, um, football had been taken by uh, Adidas before Jeff and I left the parent company. So to get into football would have cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. However, getting into athletics was much easier. <clears throat> and we had local clubs, so we were growing. Um, I, we devised a way of uh, going, well, going national with this. So we were growing nicely. We were also doing rugby boots. <clears throat> so we had a growing company. It's not as though that 11 years we were just standing still. Mm -hmm. No, we were growing and uh, um, in fact, we were growing that well that uh, a company decided that they would ask me if they could be our distributor. So instead of me di selling to sports shops, People were seeking you out. I, I could sell all my product to one person and they would, uh, they would sell the product. So that gave me more time to think of other things, uh, which we did, and America was one of them. And uh, I mean, I had four years trying to get into America. One guy, Shu Lang, he was a, an immigrant Russian and he, his family had come in uh, from Russia. And he tried hard and he knew a lot of athletic clubs, but for whatever reason, we just couldn't get beyond the one or two clubs, which was difficult. So it, it moved all the time we were moving. And I had at least six attempts. Mm -hmm. I had six different people in that 11 years that tried and failed. So it's not as though we were sort of knocking on doors and nobody opened. Yeah, the doors opened, but mm -hmm. we didn't get into the market. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we couldn't step through. It was that five star run issue and running actually becoming a big, big uh, but something very big in America. Yeah, and w one of the most surprising things for me in the book was essentially like the, the big pivot which really blew up Reebok on, on a world scale. And that was um, your friend An Angel, Angel, Angel. And uh, he basically came with the idea that, that women's aerobics was going to be a really big market. And I think against the will of other people in the company, just went ahead and developed the shoe and talked to customers and things like that. And it, and it blew up because women's sizing was neglected. And I think it was New Balance, which were just focusing on that women's aerobics market. They just had a white shoe. You guys went for the bright colors. I think you went for a soft leather. And that is really what scaled the turnover of the business. But like that, for me, that was so surprising because so many years it's been spent like being a running shoe. And then it was an aerobics shoe, which really blew up the revenue. And when I'm mentioning revenue, if, if my numbers aren't mistaken, your turnover from like 1983 to 86 went from $3 million to $12 million to $60 million to $300 million to $900 million in consecutive years. And uh, first of all, are, are those numbers roughly correct? And was it because of that aerobics shoe which really propelled Reebok? Is that right? Well, I mean, yes, you've got the story there, okay? It's uh, the numbers very... As, as far as people are concerned, I mean, to get from almost zero to 900 million in about five years. And that, that was the, I mean, that was incredible growth. Mm -hmm. And at that time, everybody was really uh, full of this. But I, what happened when you analyze back is we became a woman's company. Mm. And uh, from being what we thought we were, a running company, and you're right, pivoting, uh, as, as would do, because uh, Arnold, in fact, his wife, Frankie, was going to uh, these classes mm -hmm. and coming back and coming back with friends and they're all full of it and Arnold saying, Frankie, what, what are you doing? And she said, well, we're, uh, we're actually exercising to music. Really? Yeah, it's aerobics. Aerobics? Oh, 
Can I go? So Arnold went down to have a look at what was going on, and that's when he saw the instructor who was wearing, we think, a, a New Balance shoe, um, a white sneaker, just a white, new, and half the class the same, the rest wearing nothing. That's when Arnold thought, why don't we make a shoe specifically for these women? And switching gears slightly, I'd love to talk about you know family business because it started off as a family business. Um, your grandfather, Foster and Sons, your father took control of that. Your brother and yourself worked together very closely. And then you had disagreements with the way your father was running the company. You set up your own one. So <coughs> if I'm not mistaken, you didn't have the best relationship with your father, but you had an amazing relationship with your brother, Jeff. And what, what would be your advice to people today which are considering getting into a family business, either working with a, uh, a parent or a brother or a child or something like that? Like, I know everyone's family is different, but you've kind of had experience uh, through family business, and, and so have I. I came up through a family business as well. Um, what, what would be your advice to anyone who wants to get involved in a family business? Well, I think the relationship that you have before you get involved is very important. Mm -hmm. If you have a working relationship as a family, that's okay. But if everybody's doing different things, um, when, when you come to become part of a family, you've got to define things very clearly. Mm -hmm. Who's doing what? And this worked very well for Jeff and myself. Jeff, he loved the factory, mm. absolutely loved it. He just wanted to make shoes. And, uh, and he said, Joe, you do the rest. Because he knew I didn't particularly want to make shoes. So <laughs> you do the rest. And, well, what is the rest? The rest was better. But we, we had a distinct difference. He looked after the factory. Um, I mean, there's a story about the Aztec. You know, Aztec was a, a light blue with a yellow and a red stripes that uh, formed the uh, vector. And uh, I designed the shoe because I'd picked up on the five stars and everything. This is what we need, Jeff, and okay. So, but, and I said, we need a blue shoe. I left it at that. And okay, we got this nice light blue nylon. And uh, this, what's this, yellow and red. I said, Jeff, where did you get the yellow and red from? I <laughs> said, how did you get that? It's the only two colors I had. <laughs> So <laughs> that was our designing. These were the only two colours of plastic that he had that he could use. So, uh, I mean, so much of that is just, it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but he looked after the factory, I looked after everything else. I did a lot of the designing, I did a lot of the drawing, and went to the factories and went to different places to, uh, to get the, uh, uh, the mouldings for the sole and things like that. And Jeff looked after the factory. Mm -hmm. So when you say, you know, we can... We, we couldn't work with uh, my father, but my father and uncle didn't get on together. Mm -hmm. They just fought. They were feuding. They were, I mean, I think it was five years between them. A bit like Adidas, uh, Adidasler and uh, Rudy Dassler, they didn't uh, yeah, get on together. Right. They were Adidas, yeah, they didn't get on together yeah. either. So Rudy left yeah. and, and he set up Puma. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why. With the Fosters, they just kept feuding. Mm -hmm. They just kept fighting and, and that, that was taking the company down. Mm -hmm. That's why Jeff and myself had to leave the company. Mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, we saw the company failing. We tried to uh, tell uh, uh, my father, we tried to get him to change, but he couldn't get on with his brother. So I don't think it would change. Mm -hmm. you know, nothing could change. So the only answer we had to that was to leave and set up our own company. Mm -hmm. And. Um Chapter 25 uh, is dedicated to your brother, my brother Jeff, and I think that like uh, what a lot of people don't realize about your story is that you went through a lot of really hard things uh, as well, and um, losing your brother, I think he passed away when he was in his mid-40s, and that was mm. at a time that Reebok was just still growing a lot, and um, I, I got emotional reading that chapter because I work very closely with my brother and right. we're, we're a year and a half between us. We get on so well, we're best friends, we've been through everything together, we run every important decision by each other and I would imagine it was the same with you and Jeff as well. So I couldn't imagine what you went through at that time but then to continue to growing the business as well. Like how, how did you cope with that? Well, when this happened of course it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. It was an absolute... It, I mean, the, you can't really describe the fact that the two of you have been doing something, and when two of you are doing something, you can, you share the problems, you share the answers. You know, it, it, if I was making a lot of decisions, and Jeff, 
he was a good sounding board, mm -hmm. and we, we we never had a harsh word between us. We never fell out. We, you know, I may have done some stupid things, but he must have been very tolerant of what I was doing and to let me get away with it, maybe. But maybe he was brighter than I was in the fact that, uh, you know, if you're working together, you achieve. If you're pulling apart as father and uncle would be doing, there is no achievement. There, you, you go nowhere. You just that's it. So. When, I mean, his death was, yes, I, it took three people to replace him. That, that was actually going to be my next question, because um, in, in, in the book you said that a after he, he passed, you had to hire three different people to do the role that he was doing. And d do you think that that was a result of, of him getting ill, was that he was doing too much? And I think as entrepreneurs, we sometimes lose track of our health for the main common goal of, I want to build this business, and we sacrifice things in, in family and health and all sorts of things. But do you think that that had a strain on him that because he was doing so much is... Well, we have a different, uh, uh, different theory to it because uh, Jeff was a... Um, he loved his running, he loves his cycling. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if, you, if you're taking part in a running race, there's maybe 200, maybe 10 of those are about the same level as you. Mm -hmm. So you're always running in that same place. But he tried harder. Mm -hmm. All the time he tried harder. Always pushing. Always pushing. To the point where at the end of every race or every cycle race, he was physically sick. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't do that week in, week out. Mm. Uh, without something happening, mm -hmm. and uh, he got stomach cancer. Mm -hmm. That's what he died of. Well, he died of an embolism, but stomach cancer is the operation they had to operate on. And uh, I think that that came about because he was physically sick, week in, week out, mm -hmm. just trying too hard. So yes, he was trying too hard, but I don't think it was uh, the actual part of the business. Even though running is was the business, I, I think that doing what he was doing was uh, not doing him any good. I mean, he was fit, very, very fit. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it, it, it must have been something like that. Yeah, with uh, with Jeff running the the factory side of things as well, I wish I would have had the, had the opportunity to speak with him as well to you know hear some stories from uh, from inside the factory as well. And the the, the book kind of takes you on a journey, and you know you go through the the history of the company, the growth of the company, the hard things that you went through. But there's also some, some really funny stories in it as well. And what what I found quite comical, I was having a little chuckle to myself when I was listening to it. So I listened to the audio book and then I read the actual book uh, as well is that when you get like entertained by suppliers uh, as well and I think you, you went to Japan but this time you weren't traveling alone you were traveling with your wife mm. uh, at the time and uh, to entertain you they, they they gave you some like British like strippers or, or, or something like they that. They did indeed. Well they, uh, they took us to the for, for a meal and entertainment and the entertainment was three British girls <laughs> stripping and uh, okay <clears throat> Right, we sit there and uh, I, my wife was looking at me, I'm glaring at me probably. But probably the worst thing was at the end of the show, they actually brought the girls to the table. Mm -hmm. in, thinking that this was lovely, you know, yeah, they, yeah. they were doing us great, a great lot of favour. appreciate it, yeah. Yeah, and um, of course you, you've got to talk to the girls and these girls apparently uh, during winter in Japan they moved down to Australia so they were doing what they were doing in Australia during the Australian summer then they'd move up to Japan and do it during the summer there so uh, but my wife she sort of said we've got to go I'm you know she was saying she was sick and whatever I had to say my wife's not feeling too good so we've got to go and uh, so we had to leave and you know I mean and I got this is what you always do isn't it and I said no this has never happened in my life <laughs> ever before that there are lots of things that you don't know about, but this has never happened before. And it's like, as you know, when you're traveling, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you go to the Far East and in the way they try to um, entertain you. Entertain you, And of course, it usually involves women or something like that. Either you're drinking, or yeah. they, but uh, I mean, you just have to take a view of it. And, yeah. uh, you, you know, the culture I mean, is different. And, uh, oh, um, yes. But I, like I, I've been in some funny situations myself as well, so it, it was nice to sort of uh, hear like your stories um, about that as well. And um, moving on a little bit, so I heard the the podcast you did with Ed Milet, and in that you said that you've been to Ch China before, but you know you never you've never been to the Great Wall. 
and it's like when, when you were going to these places, was it was the business so intense that like you didn't have time to go and do some fun stuff, or did you always make, make a point to be like, right, when I go to a new destination, I want to actually enjoy this as well. I'll work for five days, I'll take a day off, I'll go to see the local tourist attractions. Like, what did a typical overseas trip look look like for you, like in terms of the schedule? I, I think the schedules were such that I just did business. Um, you see some of the things that the people want to take you to. Mm -hmm. But I never, I never said, look, I'm going, I'm spending two days away from here or what. Yeah. I, it, w it was always very simply, just get the business done and carry on and move on, mm -hmm. whatever it was. Because uh, <clears throat> whilst you're out there, they want to entertain you. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to say, leave me alone. I'm going to do my own thing. It never happened that way. Mm -hmm. uh, either, I mean, maybe I could have said, look, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Um, when my wife went, when my wife went to Japan, they did take her around to see her some temples and mm. stuff. One of the trips we went to Japan, we went on the uh, bullet train yeah, to took Kyoto it. and back sort of thing. We did that, mm -hmm. um, but I think there probably should have been many things. I never saw the Great Wall. Mm -hmm. um, then again, you know, I did such a lot and I saw such a lot. Mm -hmm. But I'm travelling alone for most of the time. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is one of the things that really people didn't understand that uh, I have no communication. You know, if I wanted to telephone, yeah, I, I'd have to ask the reception could I make a telephone call to the UK, and it wasn't a simple matter of just dialing it through. Yeah. They had to book lines. You know, there's only so many telephone lines in those days. We didn't have satellites. You know, we didn't didn't have that sort of communication. So if they couldn't get a line, mm -hmm. they couldn't get your telephone call through. So very rarely could I actually speak from when I'm away traveling, even in Europe, mm -hmm. it was difficult. I couldn't speak to anybody back in the UK. It, so really spending time and doing things out there wasn't really uh, on the cards. It was more or less mm -hmm. do your business and get back because you need to trans you know, tell everybody this is what's going on. Yeah. You know, if I picked up a new distributor and I wanted a uh, distribution uh, agreement made up, I had to come back mm -hmm. to get that done, not spend two or three days uh, doing tourism, as it were. Yeah. And even even the things I did see, I, after my three, I think it was three or four weeks on my round the world trip, <clears throat> I arrived back. And in fact, we should have, uh, as I said, the, the airplane that went on this round the world one was going east, and, and Pan Am 2 went east all the time. It just never stopped. London, where we should have landed, was fogbound when I was coming back, so we had to continue on to Frankfurt. So I spent another day in Frankfurt whilst Pan Am 1, coming the other way, arrived to take me back to London. By the time I got to London, then up to Manchester, uh, it was late in the evening, and I phoned my wife, I got on the telephone and said, look, I will arrive in Manchester. Oh, I can't pick you up, I'm going to, I've got an art class. <laughs> so I, I've been away three weeks plus, and my, I couldn't get picked up from, from, I think it was Bury at that time, I got the train mm -hmm. to Bury. I had to get a taxi from Bury up home to where we were living. So, and then you speak to people and say, you know, you go into the office and say, hi Joe, how's things, all right. Yeah, but you know, you, you have no way. I mean, I went into, um, I don't know if you know Ginger Rogers. No. Uh, Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire. Mm. Fred Astaire, they did these dancing together. That's right, And yeah. this was in, uh, in California. Yeah. And Ginger Rogers was a big film star in those days. <coughs> oh, she'd actually died by the time I, w but I went into her house mm -hmm. and <coughs> saw the murals on the wall, saw the whole house. And I experienced that, but nobody with me. Yeah. <coughs> now, when I travel, two tickets. Julie and I, we travel together. So that if you have something to see, you share that. Mm. <coughs> so and, and you said the key word there, like lonely. And it, like I, we were talking before at lunch and I, I went to China for the first time in 2010. And even back then in 2010, there wasn't much social media. There was Facebook. There wasn't even, smartphones were just sort of emerging. And like I would post a Facebook update to be like, oh, I'm in the city, but it'd just be text, like no photo. And honestly, like that time, like it was really lonely. 
and I was just in China, going to different factories, going to different rural towns, cities I'd never even heard of. I would wake up one morning and not even know which city I'm in. There would be a driver downstairs who'd take me to a factory, I'd develop a product, I'd get on a plane, I would go to another city, I would develop another product range. And it was just, it was all by myself. It was in a country I didn't know, I wasn't familiar with. I was having local Chinese food, which is way different to the Chinese food we get here uh, in the UK. There was translators and it was just like, I enjoyed it at the time of my life, but it was lonely. And it's like, you come home and I'm in, I'm in the pub with my friends in Edinburgh and they're asking, you know, what's China like? And I don't even know where to start explaining it <laughs> right. because like there, there's, there's so much to share. And it's like, you see at night you're in five star hotels, nice luxury skyscrapers. But then during the day you're in rural towns, mm. um, having local food, like just dealing with local factories and stuff like that. And it's like, I don't know who will understand what I'm talking about wh when I talk about it. And I feel that you must have gone through that in a much more extreme level because this was in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and you're traveling the world, but we didn't have social media. You didn't even have like a digital camera back then to mm. like really capture the moments and stuff like that. So did you feel, it, it, it's weird to say like, it's lonely because you're building a massive business and you're doing, uh, tens of millions of dollars in turnover and stuff like that but you're by yourself and you employ a lot of people you run a massive company but you're still lonely and I just feel that's so weird like did, did, did that did loneliness ever creep in like to your head and <clears throat> how, how did you deal with it I, I think that we're using the word lonely in a fact that we're we've nobody to just chat to all the time yeah um, as against if you know somebody is a real lonely person, they they never speak to anybody. Yeah. We're speaking to a lot of people. Yeah, We're true. enjoying a lot of things in life. Yeah. We're doing things, but you know, <clears throat> there's that element of being able to relax and just sort of put your feet up and just have a chat with your your buddy. Yeah. You know, there's somebody you're with. I grew up with Glen Campbell. Mm -hmm. Who's Glen Campbell? Do you know Glen Campbell, singer? Right. Right. I grew up with him, and why do I grow up with him? Because every hotel room in America, you switch on the television, and Glen Campbell was on. <laughs> every, every, I'm like, does this guy never get off television? And so, through many years, you know, and I'm saying always, not always, obviously, but you know, so many times I turn it down, and Glen Campbell is the, you know, entertaining. So I grew up with him in in my American touring because I was like you. I'd be in a hotel room. Sometimes not the best of hotels, you know, sometimes the best of hotels because you, they're not always available wherever you are in the country, wherever you're traveling. Sure. Um, <clears throat> but yes, so lonely is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not having that familiar face, person mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I retired and started doing other things, now if people want me, it's two people. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one plus. It's, yeah. you know, it's two, two tickets and then we can. Like Julie and I went to Toronto earlier on this uh, this year to uh, see people, but we took a day off and went to Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. yeah, we did that. You can do that. <clears throat> I, I think probably possibly why I didn't trip to see uh, the Great Wall was probably had nobody to go with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, in that sense, nobody to go with means lonely. <laughs> True. Yeah. And. Um Another dynamic in the book which I find really interesting is, is to do with family and um, when you're building Reebok, you had two young kids, but you're also doing a lot of traveling so you don't have much time to spend at home as well and obviously that causes issues uh, in your family life, you're, you're missing certain things, but then it's to, for the greater good of building a massive business which will then provide a better quality of life for your family and like I struggle with that because I'm like living in different parts of the world we talked before living in China and LA Dubai now and it's like I've never really committed to having a relationship because I'm like I will not be the best version of myself while I'm focusing on my business but then I see other people which do similar things to what I do and they're married and they have kids some of them have great relationships some of them have like damaged relationships and it's like do you like have any like rules or lessons that you learned to be like how can I maintain a healthy family while growing a massive business? Because there has to be sacrifice. You can't be in both places at once. <laughs> but like, it's, would you have done anything differently or? I don't think I would have done anything differently. And mainly because we, we've got to go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s when I was doing a lot of my traveling alone. And life was different then. We'd only just moved away from, uh, we were just post-war. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, 
fathers went out to earn money. Mm -hmm. Mothers stayed home and had children, mm -hmm. looked after children, looked after the family. So yeah, I wasn't too far away from a lot of my friends, you'd say, because they would go out to work, they'd come home, then they go to the local pub. Mm -hmm. They go out you know, on their own to meet the mates and do things. So <clears throat> in a sense, we were just growing out of that to where families um, meant an awful lot. But uh, I, I think that <clears throat> a lot depends upon your partner whether they actually commit to what you, you are doing and understand and commit mm -hmm. to it and enjoy. You know, it's, it, if when you do arrive back, if the only interest is, oh, you're back. <laughs> you know, if that's the only interest, yeah. uh, then they're not committing to it. There's, you know, if, if there's that sort of, wow, how was it? You know, come on, you gotta tell me. You know, oh, can we go? Mm -hmm. If there's that sort of... Uh, understanding. Uh, understanding and sort of, yeah, that feeling that can be between, then fine, I think that works because, okay, we had a, a very unfortunate uh, trip to Japan with my wife, uh, but she did see uh, some friends of hers who, were, who lived in Australia. Mm. Um, and of course, later on, we, we had these uh, pro celebrity uh, tennis tournaments in uh, Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. And of course, going to Monte Carlo, meeting all the people, you know, meeting the stars uh, from Hollywood. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, of course, is magic. You know, mm -hmm. it's so, I mean, she had a photograph taken, sat between Roger Moore and uh, Sean Connery. Yeah, I mean, you know, the two bonds. Yeah, yeah. In those days, you know, what could be better, sort mm -hmm. of thing. So, th th some brilliant moments she was able to take, mm -hmm. but I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, a lot of business, maybe even yours, where the glamour isn't there. Yeah, yeah. You know, the glamour came into my life yeah. uh, as we sort of grew big. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of glamour in there. So that, that probably helped. Mm -hmm. For sure. But, uh, uh, but at that time, my, unfortunately, my daughter was becoming ill and uh, mm -hmm. that. So, you know, we had other things to distract uh, away, away from sort of being able to have real pleasure. Mm -hmm. And um, I've actually got so many other things that I want to ask you, but I want to be respectful of your time as well. Um, let me see, the, the exit of the business, um, I think you change roles within the company and um, obviously any business which is growing so aggressively needs finance and um, I think when your brother passed away you purchased the other 50% share that he had because his wife inherited it mm. at the time, you got that and then as you were growing the, the US division um, Paul had that side and then there was fi finance available uh, which then ev eventually the business was sold to Adidas, I believe, for 3.8 billion, which is just a remarkable amount w when you think about it. It's still crazy. Um, Adidas ran out for a while. It changed hands recently. Last year, Adidas sold it to the ABG group. And we were just talking at lunch. It was quite interesting because uh, in 1992, Reebok gave a shoe deal to Shaquille O'Neal. Mm. And then Shaquille O'Neal is part of the ABG group, which bought Reebok from Adidas. And he really wanted that deal to go through because of the relationship that he had with Reebok. Um, I don't know, just hearing those sort of stories, it's, just, it, it's cool how everything comes around like full circle, but like, mm -hmm. do you ever just think about these numbers like in terms of how you started and then like the revenue that it was doing and then the exit to Adidas? Because even, um, you weren't even on Adidas's radar until you started to grow a little bit and then they t contacted you about a logo infringement. Mm. <laughs> yes. And then mm. they, they, they end up buying you for close to $4 billion and it's like, um, what, what, what do those like numbers mean to you? Because it's just like, it's at the end of the day, it's just a number. You live a quality of life that you're very happy with. You're very proud of your accomplishments. But do you ever just think, that's crazy from where I started to, to where it is now? Like, what? Well, I mean, you, you do, but you do get used to the idea that you've moved into that area, mm -hmm. that things have happened. And, you know, and it, and it is uh, a matter of so many different things occurring. Mm -hmm. that, uh, um, and and the, the brand has just continued to grow and is well loved. And I, and I think it's going to grow again now. Mm -hmm. it, oh, we, we added us in charge, it sort of went down because it, you know, they're looking after Adidas and wouldn't you? You just mm -hmm. paid 3.6 or 8 billion and you, know, you can do what you want. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, they bought the brand mm -hmm. and they did. But, you know, and they didn't give, uh, give Reebok an equal amount of opportunity to grow. They more or less let it dwindle away. <coughs> so now it's got a, an opportunity to grow, which is brilliant because uh, it's now, we now see a different life. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, <clears throat> and, I, and I think the numbers just become numbers with zeros. Mm -hmm. You just lose the number of zeros. I mean, I, I remember many, many years ago signing my first million, do million pound check mm -hmm. for the revenue. You know, you think, wow. Well, I'm only used to selling something like ten pounds or twenty pounds. <laughs> yeah, a million pounds. Why do I want that? And then, of course, you even go beyond that, and you never bother signing any checks because they're all done mm -hmm. by somebody else. So, so you, you go through this period of you know, have we enough money for the bank? You know, well, in fact, when uh, during my early days with, um, and this is with Bob Brigham, with Alice Brigham, he was really brilliant because, you know, cash flow was going up and down, up and yeah. down, and. Uh, we even got to a point where our distributor, and that's in the book, went out of business and nearly put us out of business. Mm. <clears throat> so I'm dashing over to Manchester to see uh, Bob, and Bob, every time I went, he would give me a cheque because I needed the money at that time. Mm. So, you know, you, you're scratching for money and you, you're counting it in tens, maybe mm. hundreds, maybe thousands, but then it grows into millions and you just get disassociated. Mm. That, is, that belongs to another part of your company. And it, cash flow is such an important part of the business as well because it, it's interesting when, you, when you're placing orders to the Far East, you place a deposit for them to start the production and then when the goods actually finish, it's you know, a couple of months later, then it needs to ship and then you're selling it into retailers like you had to deal with Kmart but then the retailers want credit as well so they want to pay yeah. they want to sell the goods in the store before they pay you so they normally ask for 90 days credit. So when you actually pay your factory to when you get paid by your customer, can be like six months yeah. and the value of orders, you know, talking about 25,000 units at the start with Kmart to, to then what it grew to, like you're talking about like financing and credit, crediting like millions, right. tens of millions of dollars and pounds. So like cash flow plays such an important part and especially in, a, in an industry where your competitors are Nike and Adidas and Puma with massive budgets that go to marketing and mm. sponsoring of events and athletes and stuff like that. Barter were the biggest shoe company in the world. They had shops in every town in the UK. Mm -hmm. and they had a massive factory at Tilbury and factories all around the world. But I can speak to people now and say, remember Barter? Do you remember Barter? No. No. B-A-T-A. You don't remember. And yet, they were massive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely massive. I mean, we were with Tom Barter only last week, and we had lunch with him. And you know, they're big in India. They're big in Latin America, but they've lost the United States. They've lost the UK, just because they're shoemakers. Mm -hmm. And shoes have now shoes have gone to sport. Shoes are now influenced. They're all sneakers now. Mm -hmm. you know, we all wear sneakers or something which is influenced by sneakers mm -hmm. as against your basic street shoe it used to be out there 50 years ago. And then it's interesting as well because like now it's evolved from sportswear performance to fashion and style as well. Mm, yes, and yeah. um, you know, Reebok shoes are both fashionable and, and hold like stylistic uh, characteristics as well. But um, sort of wrapping up, what what advice would you give to someone who wants to get started in business today, who's read your book, who's heard your story, and they're like, right, I'm inspired now, I want to start my own brand. Uh, any words of advice for someone who's just getting started today? Well, you must enjoy it, <clears throat> whatever you're going into. Uh, go into it because this is something you've chosen, mm -hmm. <clears throat> something you're going to enjoy and make sure. Because if you, if, if you stop enjoying it, Mm -hmm. And I mean, by that I mean if it becomes a real drag and, and you're just getting up in the morning and, and you're going to work. Mm -hmm. If you're actually going to work yeah. <clears throat> and that's a pain, then get out. Yeah, yeah. Go somewhere else. Because it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. And, yeah. and the chances of success are, are, are remote mm -hmm. because you've not got something, you've not got that spirit behind it. Mm -hmm. you, you, you need that extra something, you need to take that extra mile. Uh, you, you need to be sitting at your desk, whatever it takes to get something done, mm -hmm. you know, and enjoying that. Mm -hmm. So, my advice is make sure you, you're going to enjoy it. Then, today, I, I think today, I think looking. Looking to make sure that you're well financed. I think you've got to look around for finance these days. Mm -hmm. In my day, we didn't have the opportunity. We just had to work hard and do it piece by piece. Mm -hmm. Now I think if you've got a good idea and you really know what you're talking about, and that's essential to mm -hmm. know the business you're going into, know it fully, and what you don't know, learn, mm -hmm. really learn. Um, and today you need to be fully aware of computers, computerizing, everything that you can get from that 
all the tools that are there now know about it, know about it fully, so, so that you, you're prepared, mm -hmm. well prepared for anything that comes along, comes your way. So um, where, where can people get a copy of the book? I mean, we just kind of scratched the surface today with, with the story. Um, you've been so kind with your time and uh, we t sort of touched on a few stories, but there's way more in the book. For people who are inspired by, by your story, where can they connect with you, first of all, on social <coughs> media? And where can they get a copy yeah, well of the book? Well, if you're talking about the UK, they, they are, it, it is in uh, bookstores, but Amazon is a place where you can get it easy now. However, if you do want a signed copy, <coughs> you have to get it from us on our website. And, and the website is joefosterheritage.com? jwfosterheritage.com Perfect. And <coughs> I was actually going to ask you a favour, if you could sign my copy of the book. I will uh, indeed. As well, just wherever you, you wish. That would be very kind of you. And you're, you're, you're left-handed, right? I am left-handed, yes. They say like talented and creative people are, uh, are left-handed. Um, but as, as, as we wrap up, Joe, I just want to um, acknowledge you as a person. Thank you so much for the, the knowledge and the story that, that you've shared. You've uh, inspired a lot of people, uh, including myself. And um, just I I even hearing your story and seeing the book online and uh, reaching out to you on social media, you were so kind to, to reply to me and to set up this interview. And I feel that a lot of people will gain so much from, from hearing your story. And um, here we go. Oh, thank you so much. The, um, the, the, the world is a much better place with you in it and through the products that you've inspired and developed and inspired people to, grow on, to go on and create their own brands as well. Um, you've just made such a fantastic impact uh, on myself and to millions of other people, so I just want to acknowledge you for that. Um, as a, I just got a small gift uh, for you guys as well because I'm involved in a family business as well, uh, Highlander. So first of all, I, uh, I've got you guys a... This is a Highlander catalog with all the products wow. that we've developed. So right. I, I want you to have a copy <coughs> of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, anytime you need any camping and outdoor products, you let me know uh, and, I'll, and I'll send it to you. Uh, I've got you guys some small things. I'm sure you can sign the front of that for me. <laughs> for sure. Uh, I've got you guys... So first of all, one of my favorite products that I developed was this uh, Stone Go Pack Away waterproof jacket. So because Ooh, you guys right. do a lot of traveling, we do. Uh, I've got you guys this uh, waterproof jacket as well. So basically it's lightweight, breathable, hood, cords, everything. Uh, and with, with mm. the size, it's just something you kind of keep in your bag or keep in your car and it will always keep you dry. That's good. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. There's also a couple of water bottles as well, some new uh, <laughs> cool colours as well, so if you ever want to keep your drinks insulated, you've got that as well. There you go. Um, oh, we use those, yes. And I've got you guys a hat, and uh, Julie, because you were so kind to organise this for us as well, got you uh, a down jacket as well to keep you warm uh, whenever <laughs> it's cold. But um, this is the least that I could do because <coughs> you were so kind uh, to give us your time and to, to share your story and to go over the book. So I just want to say thank you again so much. Uh, and it's been an absolute pleasure and really appreciate you yeah. taking the time. <coughs> really but it's been a pleasure it. to where I was came. And you know, we're now friends. Yeah. And we'll be, we'll be meeting yeah. in many places and we'll be talking many stories because we've got plenty. Well, you know, <coughs> we've talked about the book and we, we actually spent some time talking about since the book. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of stories there and experiences. So, uh, yeah, it's been great. Thank you very much. Maybe you overstate my importance. But, uh, <laughs> I did what I did, and uh, I think that's the best you can do in life. If you can do it, and get on with it. Okay, you made mistakes, but, you know, if you keep persevering, mm -hmm. and I think persevering is very important, and, and if you have belief, mm -hmm. believe, persevere, have fun. Believe, very important. persevere, have fun. Joe Foster, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Been a pleasure. And uh, hopefully see you in Dubai soon as well. Oh, yes, indeed. We will do. Thank yes. you very much. Cheers. Right. Thank you.